All right, I'm picking back up where I left off, part two. Remember, spicy is not a flavor. It's mainly a pain, and it's kind of like adding texture to our food, but it is not a taste. Mmm, yamami, savory all over. All right, again, sweet, more on the tip of the tongue, sour on the sides of the tongue, salty all around the outside edge, bitter mainly in the back, and yamami, pretty much coating that tongue, like when you eat beef jerky or any meat product that has that savory taste due to the amino acids. All right, the, the eye, the sight. Basic parts of the eye include the cornea, the outer clear portion of the eye, which is actually nourished by the aqueous humor. It's the only part of living tissue not, or, not nourished directly by blood the blood from the iris transfers nutrients out to the aqueous humor to nourish the cornea. The cornea is a clear part of the eye, which is the very first part to bend the light. So light rays hit here and they get bent, diffracted in towards the pupil, the opening in the iris. And then the iris, of course, is this colored muscle which is really cool looking. It's unique in everyone. And as you know, I love the looks of the iris. It then goes to the lens, which further bends and diffracts the light to put it right back on the little sweet spot, which they have right here, which should straight be straight back. So this drawing is not totally accurate, but back when it's called the fovea centralis. Now these little suspensory ligaments suspend the lens up to this little muscle up here and this muscle will tighten and flatten the lens out for near vision and let it relax for farther vision. Problem is as you get older this lens stiffens up and usually when it stiffens up you're not able to see close distance so it's really not being myopic or nearsighted but it's they call that presbyopia which is the hardening of the lens, so people like me have to wear cheater readers as we get older. The vitreous humor is very vitreous. Sounds almost jelly, doesn't it? Vitreous and jelly, because it is. It's gelatinous. And it fills and plumps up the eyeball back here. And when you cut into your sheep eyeball, you'll see, you'll be able to feel that, how gelatinous it is. The con conjunctiva up here overlies the cornea and it comes up so when the conjunctiva surrounds the eye it's really if you have a contact lens on and it slips back it doesn't entirely go back behind the eye because the conjunctiva keeps it from going that way by the way conjunctivitis the word itis or the suffix itis means inflammation conjunctivitis is inflammation of the conjunctiva when the conjunctiva is, is inflamed due to infection, the common term is pink eye. Okay, the sclera, you can see the sclera comes up and it's continuous with the cornea. So the cornea is clear, then it becomes white right about here. So the sclera is the whites of the eyes. So Paul Revere said, don't fire till you see the sclera. Uh, he said white the eyes for everyone else. The retina actually lines is the inner tunic, which lines the inside of the eye. That is your sensory tunic. It has, it's made up of rods and cones, specialized nerves, neurons, which help us detect the electromagnetic spectrum of light. So we can see that little 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength of electromagnetic spectrum we call visible light, because we can see it. And it sends it up through the optic nerve here, which flips it around up at our brain, and we can detect the image. In a little bit better picture, I've colored in the vitreous humor. I took some paint to this. There's a thing called the blind spot right here in the optic nerve, and that is where the nerves come in. All the nerves from the retina coalesce right here in the middle. 
and that area you don't have open nerves it's where all the nerves enter kind of like the plug in the house so it's a blind spot notice it is not directly behind this fovea centralis is supposedly directly in line with your pupil that's the sweet spot that's when you're looking directly at something the blind spot is slightly offset and you'll see that in the sheep eyeball again and we'll do that in the labs as well you can actually find your blind spot prove you have a blind spot fovea centralis is the central spot which is mainly made of cones which see color very sweet spots when you look directly at someone you see very very accurately and very very clearly your peripheral vision is not as clear it's more fuzzy but your peripheral vision has a lot more rods in the outer edge so if you're looking at a star out in the space and you look at it and it's a it's a smaller star or not as bright it seems to diminish or vanish when you look directly at it but if you look slightly off the side you can see it because your rods are more sensitive to light than are the cones yet cones can see the red the blue and the green and the combination gives us all the colors we see of the rainbow the ciliary body is the name of the muscle which holds the suspensory ligaments which pull the lens allow it to slightly bend again the cornea and the lens bend the light and focus it sharply on the fovea centralis if that focal point is up here or back here it's fuzzy and you need glasses oh the choroid that's one i forgot to talk about lies between the retina and the sclera that's your middle tunic and it is black again if you look on the sheep eyeball when we dissect that you see how black it is its main purpose is to absorb the light so it doesn't bounce back and scatter everywhere else now on the sheep night vision animals different animals that see well at night like if you shine a flashlight at your dog or cat you see this blue sheen coming back it's they have a special thing called a tapetum lucidum and again you'll see this in the sheep eyeball when you cut it open it's a little blue band which reflects light directly back straight back so when light enters in it goes through the retina hits the tapetum lucidum located on the choroid bounces back out so that retina is innervated twice by the same photon in and out basically enabling them to see twice as well as us at night makes their nighttime vision a lot better likewise the deer in the headlights look the because those lights are really really bright so when that deer gives you the deer in the headlights look it's because those lights are really bright at night they, they're seeing twice as much bright and light hitting them as you do all right a little anatomy quiz for you you can practice this on your own click through it celery body a website gone on practice because you know this will be at least 28 percent of the test 14 points times Two. Ah, there's a picture looking through an ophthalmoscope through the pupil. You can actually see the retina. That little spot right there is the fovea centralis. So there's the retina. It's called the nervous tunic, made up of rods and cones. Again, the rods detect the white light. So they see just brightness, they don't see colors. Cones detect colors. Picture all the colored cones. Mostly cones are orange, bright orange, but they're colored. Blue, green, and red are the three column types. What are the primary colors, though? Primary colors are blue, yellow, and red. So why are the eyes green? That's a good question. Normal vision occurs when light is focused directly on the retina. Again, when the light, the focal point hits the retina, that's clear vision. When the focal point is too close, that's nearsightedness or myopia, and you need glasses to correct that. Again, that also happens with presbyopia, when that lens gets stiff and will not flatten back out to allow that to hit back there. Farsightedness, some individuals can see see far but not near. And that is the image focus back here. I'm sorry, this is the presbyopia. Nearsightedness means you can see close but not far, and that's hyperopia. Myopia, 
Myopia is nearsightedness, yes. You can see near, but not far. Hi That's hyper. Over. Strabismus. Strabismus. This is when the eyes tend to stray <laughs> in their business. The eyes business is strayed, no. Strabismus is when the eyes don't necessarily line up, so they can be crumb. So there's an example of stray business. Stephanie, what happened? Stray business. So we have some students modeling this for us. Ah, presbyopia. Look, when you get old, you need the glasses like this, the presbyopia. The light not focuses too far back because this lens will not bend as much as it needs to to focus it right here in the sweet spot. See? Who says selfies aren't good for something? Wow. That's amazing. Hearing. The outer portion of the ear is called your outer ear, the oracle. And that's about all you really need to know. Unless you can pierce, then you can talk about your helix, your tragus, your antitragus, and the lobule. Very important to know. Sound is funneled through the oracle. You can put your hand behind your ear, cup it, and you can hear even better because it directs more sound waves into the external auditory meatus, which you learned back with the bones. So sound goes through the oracle, funnels it to external auditory meatus, hits the tympanic membrane, tympani, drums, the eardrum. That, in turn, shakes the three smallest bones of the body, which I didn't talk about, the skeletal system, the malleus, incus, and stapes, because I knew we get to them here. Malleus, mallet, incus, like an ingot, the anvil, and stapes. Stapes looks like a staple or a stirrup, so you hear the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, as you learned in second grade. Malleus, incus, stapes. Those are the words you need to know and spell properly here. They connect to the oval window of the cochlea. When it shakes and vibrates, Higher pitches like this don't go that far. Lower pitches, the lower goes, goes further in the cochlea, innervates it further. Up here we have semicircular canals filled with a fluid, a lymph, a paralymph fluid. So when you turn, that fluid starts moving. Little tiny hairs up here detect the movement, and you can tell with your eyes closed which way you're turning. If someone should throw you in a car in the dark and they blindfold you, if they make turns, you can tell if they're turning left or right or whatever. You've got one going straight up and down, one shooting off that angle, one hitting pretty much horizontal here. Okay, vestibular nerve takes that information up. Cochlear nerve takes the sound to the brain. Vestibular nerve takes the motion to the brain, okay? So the inner ear consists of the cochlea, semicircular canals, and the nerves. Middle ear, malleus, incus, stapes, and the eustachian tube. This eustachian tube actually opens up at the base of the throat. When you yawn and you hear that popping sound due to air pressure changes, that's good because you're equilibrating the pressure of the middle ear in here with the pressure outside. When any little pressure change occurs between the two, and this doesn't equilibrate in here because this doesn't pop or burp, this eustachian tube literally burps, the little just tissue, human tissue, and that air coming in or out will cause that to kind of burp. And that's the crackling sound you hear. The pressure affects your tympanic membrane. That little thin eardrum, tympanic membrane, is under pressure either way. It tends to hurt some. And because it's under pressure, it doesn't vibrate as well, and you can't hear as well. So if you ever go to the mountains and your ears don't pop, or this eustachian tube doesn't open up enough to let air equilibrate the pressure, then you can't hear as well, and it can also be very painful. Ah, hammer, malleus, anvil, incus, stirrup, stapes. Know those. And here we have the diagram of the ear. Just, again, for more practice, because yes, you know that. Hmm. This incus stapes. Oval window, tympanic membrane. And again, trace the path. Yes, you need to know the path. I might ask you, draw the path out. So know the path. 
again, not a stone. 